Hey folks, I'm Lance Eaton, and in this video we're going to talk about five tips for generative AI for designing and creating learning experiences. This is particularly geared for higher education, but I think there'll be use, uh, use cases and examples that may be used for really any context for uh, teaching and learning. So a couple things we're going to cover here. We're going to talk about what you might look at or think about as you're uh, using AI, generative AI for designing, for teaching couple frames of usage to be thinking about, some do's and don'ts, and then a couple tips about strengthening your prompts. Also there at the bottom and certainly in the description for this video is going to be a link to a lot of the prompts that I share here, other prompts, other resources, just a really good collection of things that you can go to uh, and follow up on after watching this video. So let's get started. AI for designing. So we all know that you know, the, that AI tools can be super helpful in creating and providing feedback about what has been created. And so for teachers and others, uh, it's, it's often, uh, it's often the, you know, the tab that I have open when working with them or for my own work is just having generative AI open as a point of, uh, ready to ask it questions and things like that. So, one of the things that I appreciate is that we can use it for both qualitative and quantitative insights. So that is, I can ask it 15 different, I can ask for 15 different objectives related to a 200 level American literature course survey, uh, say at a private college in, private Catholic college in New England. Uh, I can ask for another 15. And then I can say, hey, I like these four or five, but I want you to refine them. I want you to enhance them. I want you to rephrase them considering X. In fact, I can actually, you know, ask it to reword them using student-centered language or with a particular pedagogical approach that I might have in mind, such as inclusive pedagogy, uh, open pedagogy, or or the like. I can lean into, uh, I can lean into uh, to helping it with uh, helping create, uh, create uh, excuse me, I can lean into it helping with creative and engaging assignments, either updating my own or asking for examples to align with each objective. And then from there, I can go certainly into uh, looking at uh, the weekly modules and seeing what I can get for weekly modules. Again, I can go for numerous, so I can like try to get a hundred, or and then see which ones I want and ask for further feedback on those. So from there, once I build up, like once I'm there, I can actually like scope out those modules a little bit more. Once I'm building out the modules, I of course can you know go back in and add say course and assignment guides, how to navigate through it. I can generate dates for all of these things, uh, and you'll see what that looks like later. And then I can take all of these materials and ask for further feedback. Uh, if I have a, if I already have content, if I already have a course guide, I can ask for recommendations on reframing language to be more accessible or more engaging tone or the like. So simply put, it's it's an incredibly useful tool to have as a sidekick, ready and able to help in designing your courses. Okay, so, but what does this mean for, for teaching? Well, again, very similarly, it can provide a lot of different things. So when thinking about teaching, you can lean further into uh, having it help you figure out what may or may not work. So for instance, with activities, you uh, you may want to see if you want to you know, do this in the classroom. Again, generative AI can be helpful in further figuring out different ways to engage students differently than you might have before. As important, it can be helpful in crafting guidance about those activities. So you can sit there and use it as that brainstorming tool to come up with new activities and also how you create those, those guidance, some clarity. Uh, I know whenever I do it, uh, an event, you know, some kind of activity, I have to think about, well, what's the framework that's going to be helpful to get it up and going, right? Like I know what I, I know what I want out of it, but am I communicating that clearly? And then of course you can always double check your activities and get a better sense of like how accessible this might be or how I may adjust this for students with different disabilities and uh, accommodations. But then you can also think about it with assessment, right? So you can create guides for different types of assessment in your class or uh, more importantly, provide examples. Examples are really helpful and it's great when we have a, a student's excellent work to show. Like we love asking a student, your work was so good, I want to use it time and again with other students. But you know what we don't have really good examples of? When the work doesn't meet the expectations. Because we're never ever going to say to a student, and nor should we, to be absolutely clear, that we would like to use their work because it's a bad example. It's an example of what not to do. 
So instead, we can actually use generative AI to show what those bad examples might be and probably some guidance with that of like, if you find your paper looking like this, here's the pathway to improving it. And of course, we can use, we can use it to help create or modify rubrics. And then there's feedback. And so this is another area that is super helpful in, in my own teaching. Uh, and now to be clear before I step forward, any forward, forward anymore, uh, I am not saying to put students' work into AI to generate feedback. That's still not a useful approach for lots and lots of different reasons from ethics to understanding you know, what it is doing and what our roles are as educators. However, it can help me to clarify feedback, which is going to be helpful. So you can use it to help create your own comment pool of, a regu of regularly occurring issues. You can also use it to take the key points that you want to write, uh, that you want to write up in your feedback and have AI adjust the tone, the language, or possible review it for misunderstandings. So I find it helpful in catching things that I might not realize or wording commentary that mm, would, might be more effective. Uh, I've also seen it used well to summarize discussions, to reflect back at the students that, uh, but that one again, you know, will only work when you're using it in a secure environment. All right, so what about usage? Different, you know, framework for usage. So these right now seem to me the, the five biggest areas uh, that I find generative AI incredibly useful and reduces uh, a certain amount of time that I might be working on things or opens up my mind in different ways about how I'm working on these. So what you're going to see in the following uh, on this following slides is you're going to see a prompt for each of these. And I'm going to talk about what that prompt is, you know, how it represents each of these categories, and then a brief look at what the response is. Just know that, you know, the prompts themselves are on that resource guide. And also I'm not showing the full response because I just didn't want to put so much text on the screen, but let's get started. So efficiency, efficiency. Uh, there are some great ways that it can be, help to reduce the amount of time on tasks. So it can help with some accessibility elements such as cleaning up transcripts or helping with image description. You can use it to adapt a rubric or generate a list of dates, steps in a process or the like, and you can use and also use it to uh, prioritize tasks based on your goal on a given day, week, or month. So this is one of my favorite tasks to show, uh, this is one of my favorite prompts to show faculty uh, and collectively it will save faculty hundreds of hours uh, over, over, their, over their lifetime. Uh, so I use this prompt at the beginning of the semester or any time I need a list of dates, right? Because we all do this. It's right before the semester, we're starting to put together our syllabus and we're toggling back and forth between like the dates for our class and pulling that up from a calendar and putting it into our syllabus. So in this prompt, I'm just saying, give me a verified list of all the Tuesdays between these two dates of this year. So I would, after the comma, I would put in 2024, 2025. And so here's an example of how AI can be task minimizing. It's not going to eliminate the task, but it's going to go from 30 seconds. It's going to go from a task that may be five to 10 minutes to 30 seconds. And uh, that can be really helpful as there's regular times that I'm looking for that list of dates. So here are the results. And as you can see, like, boom, it gives me this perfect list of these dates that now I can plug into my calendar. Um, and that just becomes extremely helpful in like my ability to organize, my ability to focus on, okay, what are the really important things I wanna see and think about in my syllabus? Another is just brainstorming. This shouldn't be that much of a surprise if you started to play with it, uh, but it can really give a lot of different ideas and continue to do so long after like I might tire out or, or a friend might tire out. So it can come up with a new activity or a different way of doing it. You can provide details and uh, ask for more ways or really be helpful in the planning, uh, giving you a set, different sense of possible timelines, different ways to, to think about things. Um, and to me, this is where it, it gets really interesting is, uh, in using it is to self-assess or look inwardly by having it ask me questions or assess uh, or provide feedback on my answers, right? So kind of using it as a dialogue partner, using it to draw things out from me as well is also where, you know, this brainstorm, AI as a brainstorming tool is really helpful. So here's a good example in this pro in this po, uh, prompt. I'm saying, hey, you're an expert educational developer with a lot of experience uh, in and around helping faculty rethink pedagogical approaches. Uh, use a variety of lenses uh, to engage, problem solving, think critically, and 
you're also a faculty member who's, you know, or a faculty member is looking to revise part of their course on adolescent development for middle and high school teachers using open pedagogy. And so from there, I ask it, all right, I want you to help me rethink about this for developmentally, you know, to update this section of a course about developmentally appropriate practices. I want you to use open pedagogy. I want you to give me topics, activities, assessments that align with that. So I put this prompt in, and again, there are these pieces. This is an example. You can go in and change these as you need. And it gives me this really nice response of like, well, here's a particular way you might do it. And again, it doesn't stop there. This is the start of the conversation. So I put in that prompt and now I might ask it, you know, dig further in. What does that assignment look like? How might I, you know, integrate that with these other assignments? How might I do X, Y? Give me five ideas about this. So continuing to just kind of like back and forth interact. And of course, content generation, we know there's lots of ways it produces content and we've seen this and this is some of the, our concerns about the kind of content. Um, but I do think there's a lot that we can look to to help us build things, right? From outlines to learning materials to strategic plans. You know, there's, I think this is where it's really helpful for us so long as we are using it responsibly. So here again, I'm saying, hey, you're an expert in de de developing collaborative student assignments. Develop a rubric that's for students who are doing peer reviews. The rubric should be accessible language, guiding the peer reviewer, three levels of evaluation, language should be asset based, the output should be in a table. So this is what I'm telling it to do. And again, very shortly, I, you know, within seconds, I get this response that gives me, oh, this is, you know, this is what that, that rubric should look like. My next question could be, give me a guide on providing feedback that actually includes helping students who are doing the peer review work through this and do this in a critical, but uh, gener in a generous asset-based approach. Data and info information processing, I regularly use it to summarize documents, compare documents, I use it with some qualitative data to just surface issues and themes. Uh, and it's pretty good at abstracting information from sources so long as you understand and are mindful about how it's working. So in this case, this is something I do regularly uh, where I am. We have uh, every four weeks we're sending out, uh, we're, we're reaching out to our students for feedback about how their classes are going. And one of the questions in there is about how faculty are using Moodle. And this means we get a hunt, and these are qualitative questions. So we get hundreds of answers over the span of, you know, every four weeks. And trying to dig into all of that to spend that amount of time can be really hard. So this is an example where I'm like, okay, look at this particular question. Identify major themes, significant concerns, examples of positive use. And then for each theme, give me a concern or for each theme, example or concern, uh, provide a detailed description, two to three exact quotes from the data and two to three recommendations. Now, I will say before doing this, I will go through the data and make sure that it has been properly anonymized. These are typically anonymized, meaning uh, they aren't putting in their names. The only thing that we're seeing is the course title, but Obviously, names can pop up, so I'll do a quick scan for that before uh, before making use of this. And so this is what it pops out. It gives me, okay, here's one particular you know theme, communication, interaction. Here's some exact quotes. Here's some recommendations. And so these can be things that I can then actually act upon, so that I can get this data fairly quickly. I can turn around and send out the relevant resources, ping the, you know, give an overview, give some feedback, help folks in the whole and potentially individual faculty move forward. And then communication, right? So this is where it can be really helpful, not just in, you know, it can edit text, revise text, review others, communications for tone, and of course can improve your own communications for conciseness and tone. So again, in this example, uh, I'm having the AI um, take a look at this email, right? So I received an email, and I'm telling the AI, you're an expert in communication, student success, review the email, analyze and provide me with different interpretations grounded in research and that will help me understand the student, their state of mind and an ideal approach. So first off, I'm not just asking for one, I'm asking for several. So I get different viewpoints. 
I'm also just using it to like get outside of my head because sometimes when we get hit with emails, and this one is probably a good example where it's, it's confusing, right? Uh, it says, hey, do the homework, don't have the textbook too much. I also couldn't make it to class last week, LOL, what I miss, right? And to receive an email like that can be, can, can certainly drum up different emotions. This allows, of course, for you to step outside of yourself and get some sense of what might be going on. And so one of the responses is just saying that, well, you know, students uh, report high levels of stress, which can negatively impact their academic performance and communication skills. So, you know, the analysis of students' terse language and fragmented sentences suggest they are feeling overwhelmed and stressed. And it can go from there. And of course, you can dialogue, you can respond, challenge, ask it for, for clarity of, of how it comes to that conclusion, etc. All right, some do's and don'ts to consider. Uh, so in our dues calendar, uh, in our, our dues column, we have be honest about the uncertainty. We're still trying to figure a lot of our ways through this. We're still trying to understand things. Be clear about that. Don't, don't it's hard to, it's not valuable to pretend like we know and understand what we need is leadership and leadership is sometimes being uncertain. Um, keep trying different things. Don't think that you've used it once, you've used it twice, you fully understand it, or you've seen all there is to see. Keep trying it. Keep trying different tools. Keep track of how you're using it. And also when and where you're using it, indicate it. And not just with students, but with colleagues, with friends. Like, don't leave it to just, uh, I, you know, I'm using it, but I'm not showing how. And then provide guidance to students about using it. And yes, you know, this should be born out of your institutional policy. Uh, it should also be born out of conversations with students and understanding how they're seeing it and how they're using it. So some don'ts. Don't discount it because you don't see its value, right? There's plenty of folks that do find it valuable in lots of different ways. And our goal is to find that bridge. Don't hide that you're using it, right? You, the last thing you want to do is, you know, be frustrated or upset or angry at students for using it or doing things that are in the in line with plagiarism, but you yourself are also doing that exact same thing. Don't put student work or data directly into AI unless you have the okay and it's a walled, in gar a walled environment according to your, your IT at your institution. Don't assume that you know if a student has used it or how they've used it. Uh, we all want to look at something and be like, oh yeah, I know. But you really need to engage those conversations with curiosity and better understanding of how they used it because you're going to find you will create a policy and students will find useful ways of using AI that do not conflict with that policy, but also um, didn't, you know, ended up using it in ways that you didn't expect, ways that are innovative, ways that are helpful. And it's our job to, to be mindful of that and be careful about how we step into those conversations. And then finally, don't use AI plagiarism checkers. They are, they are not worth the hype. They are not going to help you in this conversation. They do not create proof that a student has used it. At the end of the day, all plagiarism checkers do is probability. And I don't feel like that is a useful way to engage in understanding how students are doing their work. A probability by a machine to which you have no institutional relationship, or even if you do, you have no sense of what goes on on the back engine and no way of actually proving anything other than a machine told you. That feels problematic. All right, a couple tips for strengthening your prompt as we round this out. These are things that I do all the time and find incredibly helpful. The first thing I always do when I go to generative AI is I have it, uh, I have a prompt and I first ask this question, rewrite the following prompt to maximize the creativity and analytical abilities of a large language model, colon, and then I put in the prompt. All I'm doing here is saying, hey, you're a generative AI, how should I ask you this question to get the most out of you? And that's what it's gonna spit out. So what it spits out is now the prompt that I wanna start in a new thread. So one thing that I also like, and this was something my, my partner introduced me to, is once it's given you an answer, uh, right in you know, your response, once you have an answer, this is the next prompt, is review your answer and provide a detailed assessment of what is missing in your answer uh, that you just provided. 
So the goal is here is to say, hey, what did you actually miss? Go back and review your answer and tell me what it's missing. And it can do that pretty well. And you can do that for like one or two rounds, depending on how comfortable or how solid you feel the answer is. Here's another one. And this is where, this is the one I really, really love about generative AI is flipping the script. And so here I'm saying, I'm telling generative AI to become an interviewer, right? I'm saying you are this type of interview, a motivational recruiting employer interviewer, interview me about insert the topic, question, idea, job description, what have you. Your goal is to help figure, you know, to help figure out. And I put in what my goal or focus is. I include ask me one question at a time so it doesn't just like drop 15 questions at once. And then I also will uh, include, you know, after this number of questions, summarize, evaluate, or review my answers uh, and ask me if I want to keep going. So it's a really good, tidy uh, prompt to actually help me think about what it is that I do or don't know or I'm trying to figure out. And then finally, if you have the app version, I strongly encourage trying out the recording you're speaking for AI to transcribe. So this is where I would turn it not just into an interviewer, but having it on audio. So there's a bit of dialogue back and forth, and that can actually allow me to break out of my thoughts beyond just typing, but more freely associate. More importantly, all of that gets put together and is essentially turned into a, trans, uh, into a transcription. That when I go back on the site, go back onto, you know, into say ChatGPT, and this is the tool that I've used this the most with, um, all of that has been turned into text. And I can now copy and paste that into something so that like if I'm trying to build ideas or brainstorm, it actually has captured a good amount of that. So those are five tips. Hope this has been super helpful. If you have questions, concerns, or ideas, please feel free to throw them in the chat or to reach out. Thank you so much.